There was no covering on them at all. No blinds or nothing. So he was just, there it is. I got a by the tub. Like, and they had no shower in that, so that's not the way you can bathe. Is it not the tub? It's trying to make the same as awkward as they can. We're talking about this in front of a team. Go ahead and start. Go ahead and start. say is it time to get started might as well let's grab our hymn books and turn to hymn number 108 please stand with me and we'll sing hide thou me 108 sometimes I feel Thank you. 
good start to the service. Brother David, would you pray for the offering, please? Father, we thank you for today, Lord. Father, we just want to want you to bless this offering, Father, and just uh, bless the people on our prayer list, uh, each and every one of them. You know, each and every circumstance, there, Father. Father, we just uh, ask you to bless our speaker tonight, Lord. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, my brother. We appreciate you playing for us tonight. Amen. Has been some very pleasant weather, hasn't it? Yes. For this time of year, it has not been hot. I looked at the clock or the uh, thermostat this afternoon about 3 o'clock, and it was about 90. If even, it may have been even less than 90 on the latter part into August. I mean, I've been expecting a heat wave. Amen. I've got to take care of some business right here. I learned when I was in Bible college that you never, ever go to the pulpit with gum in your mouth. <clears throat> so, we are studying out of the book of Matthew, and I'm going to try to jump right into it tonight. And uh, I, you actually might get out a little bit early tonight because I need to meet with the officers for a few minutes, and I do not want my... That's all. Oh, okay. I told her if I don't have my lapel on, wave at me. And she's going. thought she was landing a 747. <laughs> anyway, we are in Matthew chapter 7, but we have been enjoying this great, uh, great weather. Uh, I want to start in chapter 7, if we might. Uh, in verse 16, we had gotten into this verse last week. We're talking about false prophets. The Bible says they, uh, that they are amongst us even now at this time. There are those which uh, are, uh, went out from us because they're not of us. But please understand they're still trying to use the springboard of the Christian faith uh, to pad their nest or to increase their audience. They've taken uh, and tried to present themselves as a disciple of Christ. Remember the devil can present himself even as an angel of light. Not, not opposing righteousness but actually uh, standing on the side of righteousness and said look at this I'm one of you. Uh, uh, so they are doing the same thing that we do and and sometimes it's really hard uh, to tell who they are, amen, uh, and what they are. Uh, have you ever went to a store and tried to pick out a good cantaloupe? Yes. Have you ever went to a store and tried to pick out a good watermelon? I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, years ago, I loaded watermelons as a young man. Uh, 13, 12, 13 years old for about three summers, I loaded watermelons down in Henderson, Texas. Down to Henderson, Mount Enterprise, and when the water, uh, when the hay loading was over, we loaded watermelons. And hay is better to load than watermelons. Watermelons have no handles. Amen. Uh, amen. But uh, I worked loading those melons, and we'd pack them in hay, and we'd put them in the, uh, in the, in the trucks and ship them north, and you don't want to know some of the things we did to them, but we were, we were loading watermelons. And I had done it long enough that the guy that owned the land came up and said, uh, you want to be a thumper? How many of y'all know what a thumper is? Oh, good. I said, does that mean I don't have to lift these melons? He says, you don't. He gave me this little hook bill looking knife. He said, you go through there and you thump them. If they're ripe, you cut that vine off and set them up. And these guys coming behind you is going to load them. Right now, I did that for a whole summer. I was a thumper. I can't pick a watermelon right now that's ripe. And I sure couldn't back then. I went through and looked at them, set them up. You go to Walmart now and you get a watermelon and it's green. Can I tell you who cut it? Probably somebody just like me. 
They didn't know what they were doing. Amen. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I found out something. When you go to the store to get a watermelon, it's potluck for me. Amen. I can pick one and I'll get a good one and I say, man, I'm going to go back and get a bunch of those. Next time I go back, it's a green one. I can't tell. I, I'm just at the mercy of whatever the watermelon wants to be. Amen. And when you look out, oh, and by the way, I'm going to tell you how to know how to pick a good cantaloupe. Not, the first thing you got to do is you got to worry about it being green because they pick them green so they can ship them and they won't get too ripe before you get to buy them. <clears throat> so you got to be careful about picking them green. The ugliest cantaloupe in the bucket. The one that's got grain sticking, I mean, it's not real smooth and pretty. It's got grain sticking out all over it. They're, they're sticking up a quarter inch. It looks like it's got varicose veins. That's the cantaloupe you want because those are the water veins. If they got big veins, they'll be moist inside. Unless they're green, they'll be, they'll be much better. Those ones that are real slick and real pretty, they're not going to have any flavor at all, even if they're ripe. See, you learned something here tonight. If you don't learn something every day, you, you've wasted your day. Amen? It seems to me kind of like being out in the Christian world today is kind of like picking a watermelon or a good cantaloupe. It's kind of potluck because there's so many of them that are uh, demanding our attention. There's so many of them that are uh, uh, saying we preach a, uh, uh, the same gospel. We're saying the same thing. We're all brethren. Let's just all get together under one tent and just have a, a praise party. Let's just all... No, no, no. Because everything that, that glitters is not gold and silver. But here's the problem. How do you know? I'm glad that God didn't leave me in a condition like I am with a watermelon, not to know the difference and just got to take a chance. Because a lot of those people that take chances are going to wind up in hell with the chance they took. Right. Amen? And, and, and when you look at a watermelon, it's really hard to tell whether it's going to be a good one or not until you get into it. My wife bought a watermelon the other day and brought it home from Brookshire's over in Springtown. And I think she told me she paid six or eight dollars for it. It absolutely wasn't. Well, she ate it but you know my wife. Uh, but it was just, when you cut into it, it wasn't, it wasn't green. It was way overripe. You know? So it's really hard, isn't it? Aren't you glad God didn't leave us out there at our own, own devices to figure out what the, who the truth was from and who was given the truth and who wasn't given the truth? He said they may look like all, the same on the outside, but inside they're different. A watermelon may look the same on the outside, but when you get to the fruit... The meat inside, it's not always the same, is it? How many of y'all like yellow watermelon? Amen. I remember when I was a kid, first time I ever saw a yellow meated watermelon, I thought the thing was soured. They said, no, that's a yellow meated watermelon. My, my uncle didn't grow yellow meated watermelons. And, and because of convenience, we've given up the best watermelons that ever was for convenience sake. A lot of Christians have given up good preaching and the truth for convenience sake. Amen. Back in the day we picked watermelons, we'd have a, a, a small field of these long things, whatever they're called, and I don't even remember. The, no, 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 that's the round ones. That's the round ones. These hoblong ones. The, you know why we sell those in the store? They're easy to ship. They don't roll around. You can put them in a row, put hay in between them, and stack them up, and they'll stay where you put them. You, you load black diamonds, you got to put them in there and wedge them in there because they're a big round thing. I've seen black diamonds weigh 150 pounds. We put one in a, a deep or an ice uh, thing. I worked at an ice house. This farmer brought one up that he was going to take to the fair, and we set it in a cooler for him overnight so we could take it the next day. That sucker was big as this table. You think I'm lying? I'm not. It was huge. It was a black diamond. How many of y'all? How many y'all know where to get a black diamond now? Where? Rush Springs. Where? Rush Springs, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Well, I ain't going to Oklahoma for nothing. It's, it's over the Red River. Listen, in August is their watermelon festival. My dad's laid there, so that's why. Black diamonds you can't buy anymore because they can't ship them. Oh, they won't ship them. They're just too hard. They're too much to deal with, and they get pretty good size. See, he don't even know what a black diamond is, do you? I, I doubt you. you well, they're all round when they start out. Oh, okay. Dark green. dark green, and it looks like the, a rattleback or a rattlesnake on it. It's got 
it, it's called a black diamond. Now, outside greenery looks kind of diamondy on it. Uh, and it's the real dark green and light green on the, on the hide, and they're round. And they're good, yes. And these long things, when you cut them open, I don't know how to go off on watermelons, you cut them open and you take out a, you take out a heart about this big. You cut a black diamond open, the heart's this big around. Oh, you can eat, you can eat your fill just out of the heart and throw the rest of it away. But the Lord did this for us. He said, I'm going to help you know how to identify the wrong thing. Even though it looks the same, I'm going to show you how you can tell them or tell that they are not what you should be eating. You know what he says in verse 16? By their fruit you shall know them. And most people say, well, that means if I'm looking at an apple tree uh, and it's got apples on, I know it's an apple tree. Well, that's some, of the, that's some of what it applies to, but it also applies to the fruit as you eat it. That it is, I mean, a watermelon, when you take out the heart of it, it tastes like a watermelon. It is a watermelon, and you can know because you've taken the fruit out and you've devoured or you've ate on the fruit, and it matches what it should be. How'd you like to cut open a, a watermelon and Take out the heart and it tasted like cantaloupe. Would you eat it? Would you eat it? I would not. A watermelon, when I cut it open and it's red and it's a watermelon inside and it tastes like a cantaloupe, I'm not eating it. There's something wrong with that. That's exactly what God's teaching here. When you look, look into what they're talking about and what they're doing and you see the fruit and you taste it and it doesn't taste like the Word of God and it tastes like something else, you best not eat it because it will kill you. Now, that watermelon that tastes like a cantaloupe might be a hybrid of some kind and it might be good, but I'm not going to eat it. I'll let you eat it first. And, and yeah, a can of milk. I'll let you eat it and if you survive it, I'll eat the second half. It's kind of like those shots that everybody wants to get. I and mean, if you've got them, that's fine. Don't worry about it. But I'm not getting it till I see what it does to you. Hey, Amen. And, and it's not that I'm, I, I have no religious opposition to taking the COVID shot. I don't have any uh, moral uh, uh, objection to taking the COVID shot. I do not believe in that there's a grand conspiracy with the three, four, five, six hundred thousand people that's died from it, a conspiracy to get me to take a shot that's going to kill me that's already killing them. Okay? I just want to see what it's going to do to you. <laughs> because if you wake up one morning and you've got a third ear growing on this side of your face, I'm not taking that shot. And they didn't test that shot. It's kind of like Congress passing a bill and saying, well, let's pass it and then we'll read it. That's what they did. And that's what they're wanting to do now. But nevertheless. So the Bible tells me in verses 16, ye shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather uh, grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? So here's what, here's what the Lord's going to say. If you go to a tree that looks like an apple tree, and you pick the fruit, and it looks like an apple, and you bite into the fruit, and it tastes like a persimmon, I wouldn't eat those apples. That's what he said, by their fruit. It isn't always because it looks different that you've got an orange growing on an apple tree. It may be something that looks like an apple growing on that tree that says it's an apple. Amen? How many of y'all know what a horse apple is? Amen. You bet you, boy. We used to throw those as kids. You get hit upside the head with one of those, it'll knock your brains out. Amen? <clears throat> Do horses really eat those? No. no. I don't know. No. Cow, cows will? You know what kind of tree that is? That's a catapa tree. We call it a horse apple tree. That's a catapa tree. Big leaves. You know what they produce? Catapa worms. You know, you can buy a start of catapa worms down in East Texas. The farmers have them. If that's the same tree, I hope it is. Or is that the bean tree? Is that the bean tree? Bean tree. Bean tree. Oh, bean tree's catapa. Well, we'll just change them there to bean then. Yeah, bodart. In East Texas, you can go to some of these guys that'll have a start of, of uh, uh, worms, and you can buy them and put them on your bean tree, catapa, whatever, bodart tree, and cultivate them and harvest them, they're great catfish bait. Amen? You've got to be careful 
of what's hanging on a tree and says it is what you think it is, because it may not be. <clears throat> and I can tell you, I had an opportunity once to eat an apple that a guy gave me. And you know, sometimes if somebody offers you something, be careful taking it unless you know they're not going to give you something that good. And they gave me, some of y'all will recognize this, they call them a little pie apple. Anybody know what a pie apple is? I thought for a while it was a Granny Smith apple, but then I've eaten Granny Smith since then and they were pretty good. But it's an apple that's kind of bitter and, and, and that you make pies out of. Billy, you ought to know what that is, or Peggy. A little, a little apple about this big round there. If you just bite into it, you're just not going to take, taste like a, a, a sweet, a, huh? I don't think so. It's just this bitter little apple. People make pies out of it. When you see an apple, take a bite of it. If it don't taste like an apple, spit it out. If you take a bite of that apple and, he, and it's got protein in it, meat, I'd spit it out because that's a worm. <clears throat> and a little bit of leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If I get an apple that's got a worm in it, that whole apple's getting thrown away. I'm not cutting the worm out and going on needing it. Amen. Yeah, my wife would. You can, take a he you can take a block of cheese out of my refrigerator that's turned green. She'll cut the green off of it and, take the and eat the cheese. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. I may die, but I don't think it's going to be from food poisoning. So he says, by their fruits you shall know them. And just because that the tree looks like what you think it should look like, listen to this. If it's the wrong root, it's the wrong fruit. Amen? Amen? Amen. And that's something we need. Wrong root, wrong fruit. Amen. And those that go forth as false prophets are bringing a false fruit. A fruit that doesn't come from the root of truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth. It doesn't come from the root of truth. And in fact, what they do is they try to camouflage it as being the gospel of Jesus Christ just with a little bit of adjustment. Yeah. Well, I think we talked about this last week or maybe it was Sunday, I don't recall, about how we got so many different churches in the world that all say they're Christian and they all say they're going to heaven by the name of Jesus Christ. But when you start looking, they're not all getting there through the, th through the same door. Right. Jesus said, I'm the door. Amen. 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 So he says, by their fruit, you shall know them. Amen. They bear bad fruit. I like that myself. Their preaching and their teaching are actually present themselves as the enemy of the cross. They have no truth in them. They are not a friend to God. They are an adversary to God while pretending to be a friend. Amen. I won't tell you that. I met, I met a guy. I, we're, we're being taped, aren't we? Yes, sir. Okay, we're not going to use that. I watched a guy on TV a few years ago, and uh, it was a, it was a, a, a Pentecostal-type church, and he's a pretty well-known guy. And uh, he was up there preaching, and a couple of his members out there, while they were on live TV, started uh, speaking in tongues. And he said, now, wait a minute, guys. He said, now, we're on TV. We can't do that. All the people watching us, some of them were Baptists. He said, wait till we, when we turn the TV off, when we turn off the cameras, then we'll get into our worship. You think he was trying to deceive you a little? You Baptist? Well, while he's on the air, he wants you to believe he's the same as you are. That's free. I just, just popped into my head. I remember him. If I told you who he was, most of you'd know him. <laughs> False prophets, amen? Their fruit cannot be good. It may look good. It may smell good. But if it doesn't come from the right root, the fruit is bad. I'm going to help you with this. <laughs> Even a bad apple tastes like an apple. Amen. You ever get one that's got a brown spot on it or it's been bruised? What do you do with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my grandmother, you know what she did with those apples that were bruised and what have you? She went in there and she'd peel them little suckers real cautiously and she'd pour them in a pan and she'd make the best apple butter you ever had. And it was still an apple. 
I say that for this. We who are saved are founded on the solid rock which is Jesus Christ. We are the branches and He is the root. He is uh, the trunk. He is the supplier of the nutrition. But everything that we produce isn't always good to His glory. But it's always an apple. In fact, God says one day that He's going to take all those bad apples that we produce, that wood, hay, and stubble, going to take them out of the harvest. Amen? So, don't think that we're going to produce fruit that's going to be perfect every time, because it's not. But it's always an apple. We can, we can produce no wickedness. God prunes that tree. Amen? But they which are not of Christ, they which are false prophets, can produce no goodness. For all of our goodness are as filthy rags. If it has not the blood of Christ bathing it, it's wickedness. And a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. They don't, they're just almost like us. There used to be a commercial on television. I, I, if I can get this right. And it shows, it was a commercial for a copy machine, people. I think it was, uh, who was it, IBM maybe? Xerox. Yeah, it was, Xerox, thank you. Who were that? You've seen it too, yeah. And this salesman comes in and he, he's got this copy machine and he sets it down and he says, I brought you something that's going to save you money. It's as good as a Xerox. That's exactly what they do. I've got you something that's going to make you happier. You'll get to have more liberty. You'll get to go uh, maybe do a little social drinking, a little dancing. You can go do a few things. And we're just almost like what you're used to. Just a little different. If it's almost the same as a Xerox and that's their benchmark, why in the world wouldn't you just go buy the Xerox? The Lord's been putting these things in my mind all day. I've got a half a dozen more of them. I'm telling you, He has. Oh, and well, I won't tell you that. Their fruit is evil no matter what it looks like. A false prophet cannot give you the hope of Jesus Christ. Now somebody says, now wait a minute, preacher. What if he uses the same book? First thing a false prophet's going to do, he's going to change the book. But know this, if he takes a good old Bible and lays it in front of you, and for some reason he says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's still the truth. Yeah. And he didn't make it true. God made it true. Amen. He's just misappropriated it within his lies so he can look like he's giving you the truth. We're not talking about people who are totally different than what we are as Christians. Not that they don't believe in who Jesus or doesn't even use their name, His name. We're talking about people that use the name of Jesus, that call themselves a church, that call themselves uh, believers and have, uh, are going to heaven. And yet they are going to get there a different way than you are. Both of you are not going to get there. If one man says, I'm going this way, and another man says, I'm going this way, and God says, this is the guy that's going to heaven, this man's not going. Their fruit is bad. Amen? Their fruit brings no promise of hope. It has a hopelessness in it. An emptiness in it. Say, how can someone be so deceived? Have you ever seen a real muscle car? A 1966, what was that? Chevelle, 327, 375 horse, 1100 CFM Holly sitting on it, Muncie four speed, 411 positive track, dual point ignition, three quarter cam, street cam in it. You ever seen that? When you see in your mind a fast car, what do you see? Some Hyundai? with a big muffler hanging out of the back going whoo, whoo. You know why? That's true with so many young, you know these young people they want? Some little car with loud mufflers on it. That makes a lot of noise and goes nowhere. Amen? You know why? 
because they've never had the real thing. If you've ever been in a 66 Chevelle 327, 375 horse, you won't forget it. I got in a road runner, a 66 or 67 road runner, runner with a 383 Magnum in it. And I'm not ki kidding you. The guy just got it. And he took a $5 bill with a piece of scotch tape and put it on the dashboard. He said, if you can reach up and get that in the first three gears, you can have it. He put his hand on the gear shift, and I know why he held on to it, because he'd have never got a hold of it again. When he took off and low, boom, bow, bow, you could not reach up and get that $5. He was back in the seat like that. That's a muscle car. But they don't know any different today because they've never had the real thing. All they have is lies, and so they believe the lies is truth because they've never truly had the light in them. Even the false prophet is doing oftentimes what he's convicted to do, and he believes he's doing right because he's been taught that or he's seen it or whatever it is, but he's never known the light. Amen. They have no hope in what they what they preach. Amen. They're hopeless. So it says, by their fruits you shall know them. Then what are the fruits? The first one, let me give it to you real quickly. What they preach, God doesn't bless. Do you know the Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved? Amen. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Is that right? Yes. It says that, doesn't it? Amen. Is that what it means? Yes. How'd you like to get saved? I seen this happen. I was with the man doing it. Took him back to the church and told him he needed to go somewhere else. He walked up to a, a lady. Kate, you need to help me. Just stay there, but you're the, you're the lady. Knocked on the door. Baby, she comes to the door. Baby in, his, in her arms. The baby's screaming bloody murder. If you're like me, I do not like screaming children. Every time I got on an airplane, he's right behind me. I go to a restaurant, they're right next to me. I... And this gentleman stepped up because he came by my church. He was a missionary, and he, I was, we were fixing to go door knocking. He said, well, I'll just go with you. I said, okay. And he said, how'd you like to go to heaven? Anybody here like to go to heaven? And that's exactly what the girl said. She said, well, yeah, who doesn't want to go to heaven? He said, well, are you going to heaven? She said, I don't know. He said, well, can I help you understand? Romans says, whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So won't you say this prayer, this little prayer with me? God, I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins and, 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 and let me be a, a child of God. And you're going to heaven. She said, okay, God, forgive my sins. You think she got saved? She had no idea what we were talking about. When Romans chapter 3 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, you better back up about four verses and read what he's talking about. If I believe in my heart that God hath raised him from the dead and confessed it with my mouth, That's right. what is called, what I call, easy believism, just say this little prayer. You see this all the time. Some of you can see it on TV on well, some of your evangelists that you listen to. Now, everybody wants to get saved. You just say this prayer with me. God, I'm a sinner. Now, I'm not telling you that somebody out there in that audience that's praying that prayer because he's convicted of his heart. Because God blesses his word. He says, my word will not return unto me void. But what that man's doing is sowing the seed of deception that if you say these few little words, whether you mean it in your heart, whether God's convicting you, whether it's according to what the Bible says, you're saved. Then they go out from there and say, well, bless God, I'm saved. I got saved at such and such a great big revival thing happening down in Fort Worth at the football stadium. <clears throat> a false prophet has no hope to give and God will not bless his message. Paul said, if any man come preaching any other gospel, save that which I preach, let him be accursed. Amen. The false prophet, when he preaches, 
will stress something other than grace for salvation. Ephesians says, For by grace are you saved, through faith it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Isn't that what it says? And somebody that tells me I either got to work to get saved or work to stay saved is preaching a lie. Amen? Amen? Had a guy in this church some years ago got saved. <clears throat> Been a member here for a while. And when we were talking to him, Stephen and I, he said, I came forward in a Baptist church. I felt God calling me to come forward. And by the way, let me tell you this. The wooing of the Holy Spirit, knowing the Holy Spirit has touched you is not salvation. That's, right. That's the working of God's Word by His Spirit in your heart to bring you to a point to acknowledge Christ as your Savior and forgiver. He said, I came forward and I asked what I needed to do to get saved in a Baptist church now. And I was told to fill out this card and get baptized, and I was going to heaven. Somebody missed a step in there. I believe you ought to fill out a card. I believe you ought to get baptized. First thing you better do is get to the cross. Amen. He lived that way for 25 years thinking he was going to heaven in a Baptist church. See, I get excited. I'm sorry. I'm... Their gospel stresses works, water, something else. Third thing, their source of truth will deviate from the Bible. You know why, the, why, why we have, I think, what the devil's doing, printing so many new Bibles? To deviate from the Word of God. To take out the blood. To take out the virginity of the mother of Jesus Christ. She was a young woman. She was a virgin, folks. Amen printing new Bibles so they can alter the Word of God. You tell them by their fruit. Look at what happens. In order to do that, they have to have an external source of authority. Who told you you could change the Word of God? Well, Dr. such and such, Mr. such and such, knock on your door. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Well, I've got a book you need to read. It's called Watchtower. Every person that comes in the name of a false prophet wanting to persuade you that their way is just like your way, except just a little different, will have an external source for their authority. Everyone. Can I tell you? Take them to First John, or take them to John chapter 1, and don't let them get away from it. Hold their feet to the fire. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Because, see, they don't think Jesus is God. But they've got that little book they'll leave you. Man, I was going to finish this tonight, and I'm still trying to. The gospel they preach is a negative gospel. Y'all think that the gospel of Jesus Christ is pretty positive? Amen. He positively hated sin and positively died for me. <laughs> Amen? But the Bible tells me that there's a gospel out there that's centered on doing religious things. On holy days, amen, on the law and keeping the law. And I'm not, I'm not going to begin to tell you not one thing that it's not good for us to keep the hold of the law. That we ought to walk in the things of God. Amen. But we do so because we are saved, not to get saved. That's exactly what God said to Israel, that by the law is no flesh justified. See, looks like an apple, but it's a little wormy, isn't it? 
Looks like an apple, but it's a little bitter. Looks like an apple, but it don't taste like an apple. Amen? Colossians chapter 2, verse 21 and 23. Remember we said they, re they stressed the rules and regulations. Listen to what it says. Touch not, taste not, handle not. With all, with, with all are to perish with the using after the com commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in, in, uh, in a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body. Our religion ought to look good to God. Amen. But it ought to have more than looks. Idols, gold and silver. Israel had the temple of Solomon and God took it away from them because all the gold and silver didn't keep them in following him. We started at what time? This Wednesday, isn't it? Okay. You'll get old someday. Wait. You are. The false doctrine, or the false prophet, establishes a terrible future for they who follow. There's only two futures, folks. Heaven and hell. There is no purgatory. When you're dead, you're dead and your judgment is sealed. Amen? So the false prophet brings a certainty of judgment to those who walk after their truth. They are the tares. Remember the parable of the sower? They are the tares that the enemy came and sowed amongst the wheat. That the servants of the master said, should we go pluck it up? And he said, no. No, at least they root up the good fruit. Just leave them till the harvest. Now the good wheat, now you, you, does anybody know what a tear is? Now we're not talking about a two-year-old. A tear is a tear, not, it's not a tear, that's the two-year-old, it's a tear. A tear looks just like a wheat stalk. It has the grain on it and everything. The difference is with wheat, you open the grain, the shell, and it's got a wheat grain in it. On a tear, you open the shell, there's nothing in it. Amen? And God says, no, leave them alone, at least you root up the good. And what he's saying, uh, the first time I read that, is that I thought he meant don't take those out because when you pull them out, they may well disroot one of the good wheat Buying. Then I done a little studying on it, and that is somewhat what he means. But what he means is, be careful when you go trying to purify the church and get the tares out of it, when you can't tell which one's which. Amen. There you, go. you reach down to pick up a tear, what if it's a real wheat? Yeah. Because I found there are some blood-bought believers that sometimes don't look a whole lot like wheat. Right. I'm trying to hurry. The prophet lays in store a certainty of judgment for they which follow him. All them which follow him. Not a few, all. Now please, if you've ever told me this, I don't remember you telling it to me. But I have had people tell me, I don't remember it was here, I don't think it was here. But I heard this. <clears throat> well, preacher, you know my son, my daughter, daughter-in-law, I guess, if it's his son, they haven't been going to church in years. I really have worried about them. And they're going to church, but preacher, it's not a church you'd like. They don't believe what we believe, but I'm just glad they're going to church. Really. So now they're learning what isn't true. What will take them to hell. Remember what God said about 
being hot or cold. He said, I'd rather use either hot or cold, but don't get in the middle. I believe this. It's better for a person to walk in darkness and we who are believers to carry the light high and lift it up that they might find the light than to eagerly and willingly help our kids and other people go into a place where it's darkness and there's never going to be a light there. It's always going to be dark. Because I found out something. What, you, what they get taught, their children will get taught. How many of y'all believe in eternal security? Once saved, always saved. Amen. How many of you have always believed that? No. And do you know one of the struggles that that person that says, I honestly haven't always believed that, one of the struggles they're always going to have is always coming back and having to try to hang their hat on that truth that they didn't know from the beginning but have changed their mind on? You think, uh, let me tell you how much even we as Baptists who believe the gospel, believe in the death, burial, and resurrection as the way to go to heaven and nothing else. Amen? Plus or minus nothing. And we all know, we all know that baptism doesn't save you. Water can't wash your sins away. Amen? It's the first step of obedience of a believer after he gets saved. God said, uh, uh, these things you do, do in honor of me. And we give a testimony of the death, the burial, and resurrection, and the raising up of, uh, of new life, and to walk you therein. That's what baptism is all about. It is a testimony. It is not part of the grace of salvation. And yet, we'll walk up to this little boy, and we'll say, son, how old are you? Ten? Wow. Have you ever got saved? And he says, yeah. I got baptized. And we say, good boy. No, it's not. If there's not a salvation experience before the water, it's just wetness. Amen. And that young man is hanging his hat on getting in a baptistry and getting baptized. That's false doctrine. That's a false teacher. That's a false prophet. That will lead that little boy to hell while he thinks he's going to heaven because it looks just like us. Don't we get baptized? I had a guy up in uh, Blue Springs, Missouri ask me one night when I, I, I was out. I think, no, it wasn't. It was in the daytime. I went in a restaurant and I sat down and he was there talking and I just started talking to him. Anyway, he was a Camelite. Y'all know what that is? Water baptism saves. Camelite, okay? And he said, so you're a Baptist preacher? I said, yeah. He said, how can you be a Baptist preacher when you, when you don't even believe in baptism? I said, what do you mean? I believe in baptism. He said, no, you don't. He said, we believe you have to be baptized because the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you on the cross is the source of your salvation. But that source is not finished until you put the nail in the coffin and get water baptized. How many of y'all know what Acts 2.38 says? Oh yeah, that's exactly what. I heard in Bible college, one of my professors said, do y'all know what a Acts and 2.38 will do? Well, I know what Acts, I know what 2.38, he says it'll kill every Baptist. Because Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. Got an answer? They've built the whole doctrine off of it. And it's all a misnomer. They've taken a portion of Scripture that's unclear and made it to disallow for Scripture that is clear which says you must repent and be saved. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. But we don't have time to talk about that. We're talking about false teachers. They've gone out from us because they're not of us. I know what that is. That sounds like rain. That's that 
air conditioner over here. I kept thinking, it wasn't even no clouds in the sky. Now let me show you the end result of a false prophet. It is not a lack of religion. It is not a lack of good works. It is not a lack of compassion or of mercy or of a desire to help people. It's not. Read the next verse, verse 12, 21, I'm sorry. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into uh, the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. That sounds a little odd, doesn't it? What's the will of the Father that's in heaven? That men repent and get saved. That's the will of the Father. But go on. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord. Now they're using that name of ruler, of authority, of him that we are submitted to. He's the Lord of my life. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, look at what our life has done. Have we not prophesied in thy name? That word prophesied means to, right there, means to tell forth the truth. Used the word of God and used it to tell people. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Now let me show you the illustration of that. In the book of Matthew, I think it's Matthew, it's either Matthew or John, no, Matthew. Matthew or Luke. Well, you can look it up. God called these 12 disciples together. And He said, now, I'm going to send you out. I'm going to send you out two by two. And you're going to go out and you're going to preach. You're going to cast out demons. You're going to heal the sick. You're going to do the things that, the, my, the, that my power, through my Word, can do. Make sense? I will not, uh, my word will not return unto me void, but will do that which I please. Anybody, where's my youngsters? Can y'all name the twelve disciples? Anybody know what 52 Mab Street is? Okay, we won't go there. It's the address of all the disciples. Okay, let's just focus on one. One of the J's. Was his name not Judas? No. Well, John's there too, but we're going to focus on the other one. Judas. Went out two by two. We're not told what two went with what. I don't know who went with Judas. But I know this, when Judas went with that man, he gave ever testimony of being just exactly like whichever the disciple was that he was with. And when they saw somebody that had a demon, do you not think Judas went over said, uh, and said to him, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command thee to come out? The Bible said they did. Did he come out? Yeah. Because God's Word brought him out. Best I remember, that's the man that betrayed Jesus to the cross. Hmm. You see, because the power seems to be there does not mean it rests on the man. If he has not the root of righteousness in him, he cannot give forth good fruit. Oh, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm sorry, folks, but I'm going to finish this lesson because I want to go on to the next one. How many of y'all believe in healers? You fundamental Baptist. How many of y'all believe in healers? Whoa, wait a minute. The early church, God said, I'm going to give some the gift of healing. Now what it says? But then he also says some certain gifts are going to pass away. Yep. Now here's the question I have for you. If you don't believe in healers, and I don't, I've watched some of them on TV. I watched that one out of Houston that stands clear across the stage and says, watch this. 
and slays them in the spirit. And they, <gasps> somebody says, that's all phony. Maybe not. There's a lot of other things and powers in this world. Remember, we wrestle not against principalities, but against powers. You know what we've done? We've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We don't believe in healers. Does that mean we don't believe in healing? If we don't, we ought to get rid of our prayer list. And we've got to tear a couple of pages out of the Bible. Like the last chapter of James. Which says, if there's any among you sick, let him call the elders. The church has the power to heal. Amen. It doesn't make us healers. He says, call your elder, your deacons, the people that are authority in the church and anoint them with oil. Oil does not save you or heal you. Oil placed on you as it was in the Old Testament was to identify that particular object that was to be identified for the glory of God's sake. And when you put oil on them through the authority of the church, that's bringing the body of Christ together to pray for that person. And you're going to put the oil on them that we might identify who we're asking God to focus His power on. And the Bible says that the power of healing comes through the church. But look at how it has been misappropriated. Till we as Baptists run from it like it's got a snake inside it. <clears throat> False teachers. They take what we believe and adjust it ever so slightly till it can still pass off as what we thought. But can I tell you what happens when a worm gets in an apple? By the way, any of y'all ever bite in or pick up an apple and you can see a, a wormhole in it? I'm going to help you here. That's not a worm going in, folks. That's the worm coming out. That's right. The worm was in that little seed that that apple grew out of and was inside that apple and chewed its way out. Because when a worm goes in, he's going to eat the outside up as he's going in. But you just see one little hole say, oh, a wormhole. There's a worm in that apple. Nope, he's not. He's gone. But I know what happens when he gets in there. He's not much. But he begins to eat that apple up. Oh, one more illustration. I promise I'll stop. This is too good not to. How many of y'all like to go fishing? How many of y'all like bass? Oh, I like bass. Uh, you let me cook you a piece of bass and put it on a tray and get that little bit of red off it and all that. You can't hardly tell it from crappie. It's good fish. It's good eating fish. You come out here with these fish fries sometimes, you get a little bass. When I first started bass fishing, I never bass fished until I went to Bowie back in about 81. Never did any kind of fishing. I had other things I did. I did motorcycles. I did a lot of stuff. I didn't fish. All those people fished. They came over one day and said, come on, preacher, we're going fishing. I said, I don't want to go fishing. Well, we went anyway. And after about two weeks, I was buying rods and reels and lures and fishing. And go out and throw it, catch about a two and a half pound. That's the best bass, about two and a half pounds. And you fillet it. Any of y'all ever fillet a bass? you ever lay it over, that filleted meat, and see that little tiny thing, you can barely see that little tiny kind of a creamy color, little spot right there. Any of you ever see that? Next time you do that, take that filleting knife and reach right there where that's at and flip that little round thing out of there. And he's going to go, Pshh. you know that little lure that you buy, that you throw out there that's called a little whipper tail that's got that little split tail on it? Wonder why those bass like those. That's what that's in that little white thing is. When he unrolls, he's going to have two little flipper tails right behind him, and it's a it's a little worm. And the first time I saw that in Bowie, I said, "Ooh!" And Mitchell Cleveland, he's dead now. He said, "Preacher, it's just protein. Don't even look at it. Just fry it and eat it." Next time you catch a bass, you fillet him, and look, if he's got that little pink spot or that little beigey spot, reach into the pointy knife and flip him out. I guarantee you it's a worm. 
and you just say, God bless this food and kill that worm. <laughs> Amen? Now y'all never want to eat fish again. <clears throat> he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. That's the end result of false prophets, of false teachers, of false doctrine. Now, this is my last thought. You can be doctrinally deceived and still be saved. Amen? When that false prophet uses John 3.16 and the Spirit of God blesses your heart with it and you say, based on what he says, I believe God will save me. Not based on what that prophet preaches, not based on his theology, but based on the Word of God. You can be saved. And then you can go on and live in a false belief the rest of your life and die and go to heaven. But everybody you touch and everybody you bring along into that false religion may not be so lucky. <clears throat> Next week we're going to go into something that is extremely important, I think. Listen to what he says. Therefore, That means based on everything we've been studying about false prophets. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken to him unto a wise man. We'll get into that next week. Stand with me if you would. Lord God, as we come to you tonight, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for a, for a holy word of God, one filled with the Spirit, one filled with power, God, one that when we uh, claim our, uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're talking about that which can bring eternal life. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to understand it does make a difference what we believe. It does make a difference what we are allow, what we allow to come into our life. Oh, there's many things that are uh, trivial things, things that matter not a whole lot, that are different from one church to another, but God, the gospel of Christ cannot be one of them. There must be a solid rock. There must be uh, the blood. There must be uh, that, uh, that understanding that God is holy and men are sinners. So, Lord, bless us as we study uh, this Sermon on the Mount. In Jesus' name, amen.